Right then, afternoon everybody and welcome to Decarbonising Heritage Buildings. I'm Bev Gormley and I'm the Heritage Trust Network's Programme Manager. And if you haven't come across us before, uh, we're the UK's umbrella body for non-profits that are rescuing, restoring and managing historic buildings and places. We've got almost 800 members around the UK. So if you're ever in need of any advice or support, we can always put you in touch with someone who's been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. So do get in touch with us. This event's uh, being hosted by our Wales branch. And it was originally just going to be for our members in Wales, but we thought it was such a, a really useful topic for a much wider audience. So I'm really glad that we've opened it up um, as we've had over 80 bookings uh, for this event this afternoon. So it's obviously quite a hot topic, no pun intended. Um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box um, and to use the reactions button that depending on what device you're using, it's normally at the, the bottom of the screen. So feel free to give me a thumbs up or a, a smiley face um, to give it a try. Um, when you've logged in, you might have seen a message that said we're live streaming. Lots of thumbs up. That's good. Um, don't worry, we're not live on social media or YouTube or any, anything like that. It just um, means that despite the fact that the session's been recorded, um, it's our Otter AI live uh, speech to text transcript. And you might see that up um, on your screen and a, a bright red button that says live. So feel free if you want to see what's being said um, along with hear what's being said, then feel free to use that a separate window pops up. Um, quite often we find that lots of really useful information shared in the chat box. Um, so if you want to save that information at the end of the event, if you just click into the box where you would type a message, click on the three dots and select save chat and it will save to your device wherever you want to save it. So that's enough from me. I want to give a really warm welcome this afternoon to Matt Fulford from Inspired Efficiency, who's going to talk to you about some of the key challenges and solutions to making historic buildings net zero carbon. And there'll be time for questions later on. I'll keep a log of all the questions and put them to, to Matt at the end. So thank you so much for joining us, Matt, and over to you. Thanks, Bev, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and thanks for inviting me to speak to you all uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to do all the button pressing bits and share my screens and get those up. So hopefully you can now uh, all see uh, those slides. Um, going forward there, brilliant. That's always a good start. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I'm uh, going to speak for about the next 45 minutes um, and uh, on, on, on obviously the subject of uh, future heating in heritage buildings and really that's with a focus of uh, the requirements for uh, the future heating um, for all buildings, not just heritage ones, uh, to move to being a decarbonised or a net zero um, solution uh, where they're no longer emitting uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that's really the, the challenge uh, that we have for for the future of that heating. So I'm going to run through um, kind of lessons from the delivery of um, three projects. Uh, they're the uh, the buildings that are photographed uh, at the bottom there, um, which have all converted to being net zero carbon in the last oh um, I was going to say ten years actually it's twelve. Um, the, the 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 church on the left there um, yeah did it in two thousand ten. Uh, so we've got a we've got a bit of history on that and some of the, the lessons and uh, stories from uh, those buildings, um, uh, and, and some of the results also that we've run with a uh, a project called Wayfinders that's run with Church of England um, on looking at the issue specifically on decarbonisation on heritage buildings. Uh, obviously, on the, the Church of England estate that was, but that looked at their schools and churches um, and colleges and offices and and, and, and not just um, uh, places of worship. Um, I want to cover something on key technologies, um, just so that everybody's up to speed with um, what those technologies are. I'll share one of my pet hates with you in a moment uh, on those. Um, how changing energy prices impact on that and some of the strategies um, for particularly for estates um, and, and funding uh, what it is uh, that is out there. So there's quite a lot to cover. So I will go through at a, a fairly reasonable pace, but we can delve into more details uh, during Q&A later 
uh, if you uh, want to ask questions about any particular bits and pieces um, that we run through, say, put them into the chat and uh, Bev is going to kindly keep an eye on that for me. Um, but equally, if, if uh, as, as we, we get to the end later, people want to uh, take themselves off me and actually pose me a question, that's that's fine as well. Um, and keep it all fairly easy going and uh, informal. So um, in terms of, of kind of going through these, these three buildings, as I said, they're all net zero carbon buildings now. They're all uh, heritage buildings. Uh, the two churches there, they're actually only about three miles apart. Um, uh, our grade one listed buildings um, and then there's a school on the right hand side there um, which actually isn't listed but is in the conservation area and has a, um, a kind of the core front of the building is very much a, a classic sort of Victorian school uh, building that's then obviously been extended over time uh, in there. Um, so the first one is actually uh, a church called St Michael's in Withington. Um, they're actually all in the Cotswolds which is where I come from. I've had a hand in all of these as you'll probably uh, quickly deduce. Um, uh, so this is St Michael's Withington, uh, it says a grade one listed church um, dating back to Norman times and, and in the Cotswold of and conservation area. Um, it was heated uh, from an oil boiler with cast iron radiators, a couple of fan heaters in there. Uh, and back in 2010, uh, we looked to try and uh, move this building so it was actually the first net zero carbon uh, church uh, of the modern era. Uh, so this is this is 12 years ago we managed to, to move this to net zero carbon so can it be done yes absolutely we've done this for for, for, for you know easily 12 years um if not longer um on there um the project consisted of all those normal things you'd expect to see uh to help to save energy uh predominantly around the lighting because actually within churches mainly it's lighting that is a predominant electricity use in there so moving all the lights to leds and and, and all those good things that we we probably know um all uh very well uh because we've been doing them for some time and from the heating point of view um this church looked to replace its uh, old oil boiler with a biomass boiler um at the time so um that was its its decarbonized heating solution it also had some solar panels on the roof to generate um this electricity as well uh the roof is is non-visible uh hidden by a parapet um and it's got a non-penetrative uh pv uh, fixing system uh, on the top of it. Um, but really, we're here talking about heating. So um, uh, we, uh, we'll talk about the heating, uh, which was a, a biomass boiler. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, that was to replace the existing oil boiler. So it didn't change anything to the radiators or anything like that at all. Literally, it was a boiler replacement down there. Um, that boiler, um, huge as it is, has actually only got 38 kilowatt output um, in there. Um, so I think the first thing to learn is that uh, biomass boilers are very large bits of kit. Um, so if you're looking at a gas boiler or even an oil boiler uh, that had a similar amount of output, it would probably be about an eighth of the size of that. Um, so it's, it's very, very much larger in there. Um, this church, um, and it's sort of important thing to note really, um, that's the only used, occupied, had people in it um, doing various services and other events uh, for about eight hours per week. Um, so uh, with this biomass boiler, uh, it, the decision was made actually that um, it didn't actually need to be on that amount of time. It was sort of on for 10, 12 hours a week by the time it's sort of got a bit of a warm up in there as well. Um, so the pellets for this boiler were um, uh, delivered and stored in bags and then loaded by hand into a hopper um, in there. So um, that's that's how the sort of the strategy of this one um, worked. Um, and at the time, 12 years ago, we managed to grant fund all of this, which was 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 great um, in there. So uh, that was that was one in, one in there. Um, but if we now look at that sort of, we actually did a, a, a study back on there uh, on this project um, after it had gone through 10 years. So we're now actually 12 years on. So the, 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 the study, the 10 year review was was two years ago. Um, but it, it really did um, uh, look at what went well and what didn't go well. Um, and the lighting went very well indeed. In fact, Actually, no one noticed uh, the lighting had been changed. Um, there would only be one lamp failure in, in 10 years. Um, and actually, at the time, we were using mainly compact fluorescent lamps um, uh, as a solution because that was what was around uh, 12 years ago. Obviously, it's moved, moved on to almost entirely LED now. Um, so, lamp failure is not an issue, um, and appearance worked really well from the lighting. Solar PV, again, had been a, a, a great success. Really, there's been virtually no maintenance uh, required at all um, up there, and it had outperformed the generation estimates. So that had worked really well. The biomass boiler, however, had not been the biggest success in the world. Um, 
the main reason um, for this is, as I say, we just used it as a boiler replacement, like for like, take out oil, put in biomass. Um, it didn't seek to address any issues with the existing heating system within the church. So the fact that the radiators are slightly undersized, they're in the wrong place, um, the heat distribution wasn't really great. It, this project didn't look to, to, to deal with that issue. So in fact, all of those kind of heating comfort issues inside the church still remained. Um, but the radiators were in the wrong place and, and it, it wasn't quite kind of cutting the mustard in terms of providing thermal comfort. Uh, in there um, because of the heat emitters inside the building. So that, that was really the, the, the main problem um, in there. Uh, the experience of, of the biomass boiler was there was very, very frequent minor issues with it. No big failures, but lots and lots and lots of little ones, mainly with the system that got the pellets from the hopper to the boiler. Um, so there are all sorts of suction pipes and um, uh, other bits and pieces uh, on that system. And it would be very easy for the pellets to get blocked either because uh, a couple of pellets are a bit too long or they're a bit dusty um, or they'd sat there over summer and hadn't moved for a little bit or something else went wrong somewhere on the line. And uh, I would say it was quite usual to have at least a monthly, if not a fortnightly issue uh, with the pellet feed somehow getting stuck. And uh, yeah. It could normally be resolved um, uh, by people on site, uh, not a major problem, uh, but the frequency of it uh, obviously made it quite difficult because the system didn't come on when you wanted it to at four o'clock in the morning or whenever you'd programmed it to because there was an issue and then a light flashed and someone had to go and deal with it. So definitely uh, the experience there was, was that biomass boilers were very heavy in terms of maintenance requirements. And in fact, when I speak to lots and lots of other um, uh, organisations with biomass boilers, that is a common feature uh, that the maintenance of them is, is almost a daily, um, depending on how quickly you use them, um, a daily activity just to keep, keep them going through. Uh, they are quite maintenance heavy. Um, and there was also the issue that it's actually the, the manual loading of the pellets, which was just the design of this system. It worked for a few years and then people started to get a bit fed up with it. And people got a bit older and um, actually that, that became much more of a chore um, as, as time went on. Obviously, that could be addressed, um, corrected with a, an automatic kind of uh, process. But uh, those were the issues that came through on that. So actually, uh, back uh, last year, um, or yeah, no, no, that's a bit, a, a bit longer than that. Uh, they actually changed. Um, they actually have now stopped using their biomass boiler and have installed electric under pew heating. So these are direct electric pew heaters that have been installed underneath uh, the pews and the radiators um, that are uh, actually there. They've been retained in the church, but they're now no longer be used. And they found that these under pew heaters um, really are working very well and providing with, with much better thermal comfort uh, than, than the heating system did either when it was on biomass or when it was on oil before. Um, so uh, that's that's where they've gone. Um, and they've now purchasing all their electricity um, uh, from Ecotricity. And obviously their, their PV panels are still there generating um, a lot of the electricity needs as well. But obviously they generate more in the summer. Um, and less in the winter and the heating uh, which is now electric um, is is running in the winter so that's really been the, the kind of the lessons from uh, that one um so the the, the, the second church um three miles up the road um if you really want to know i actually moved house from one village to the other somewhere in the middle of all of this so that's why it's these two churches um they're, they're both my local parish churches um so uh, uh, yeah three miles up the road um, uh, St Andrews in Chebworth very much learnt the lessons uh, from um, St Michael's in Withington. Um, so it had very, very similar issues in terms of it needed to replace an old oil boiler uh, that was sitting down in its uh, undercroft basement area. Um, and it decided it wanted to go all electric. So we went straight to, to electric under pew heating in there. It didn't have a big enough uh, electricity supply to support that. It only had a single phase 100 amp. Uh, for those technically minded um, uh, electricity supply going in there. So we needed a three phase power supply. So we had to, that was underground. So we had to, to, to dig that uh, through a stretch of the churchyard with all the archaeological implications of that um, and move to a full electric under pew heating system. And they really did very much enjoy uh, hugely significant improvements in the thermal comfort of that church. So it was never previously the warmest church around. Um, it'd be quite uh, frequent to be um, singing the hymns and seeing the breath come off uh, you. And now that is all very much a thing of the past. So again, we've got electric under pew 
um, heaters that have been installed. We actually installed two types here. Um, uh, this brown, slightly squarer one, made by BM Thermic, um, uh, in the nave of the church, and um, this black uh, one with just a swan neck line on the top, um, uh, actually in the chance of the choir sticks, uh, in there. So the, the two types are in there. Again, this church is used predominantly for, for Sunday uh, service, um, perhaps in midweek choir practice and, and bell ringing, but really it's used very lightly, which is why this system works very well. Areas where they haven't got pews, they put in other forms of electric heating. So we've got a, a, a very flat panel heater um, that has um, gone in behind the altar there. Uh, we've actually used an overhead heater uh, in a more open plan um, area. So this um, sort of flying saucer uh, type thing um, is actually a heater that heats all this area um, beneath in there. Um, the small panel heaters have given a great advantage. So when we had big bulky um, fan convectors before, uh, they've now been removed. Uh, we've actually retained the, the previous power supply that went to them. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of cleared this area. We've got much more room around uh, the, the, the fonts now. Um, and in kind of get a better view of the architecture in terms of the stonework around the, um, uh, the door there and stuff as well. So uh, there are those improvements that have happened um, from there. So the, the, the lessons that have really been learned from um, uh, looking at that church um, is actually the brown um, BM Thermic uh, pew heaters. Um, we tended to find people preferred those. They work slightly better than the other ones. Um, uh, the, the, the black swan that ones, they definitely look nicer, um, but because they give their heat out um, kind of as a line at the top of the heater, um, people would often complain that they had this sort of hot burning line on the back of their legs. It wasn't actually burning them, but it just felt like that. Um, uh, we, you really need to heat underneath the entirety of the pew. Um, so the entire length of it, um, if you only heated under sort of one section of it and then sort of missed a bit, uh, then the person sitting in the bit that was missing uh, didn't uh, get the uh, to enjoy the heat uh, that came out of it. Um, uh, really interestingly, um, uh, we originally uh, wired the system in, so it was using actually the old um, uh, boiler programmer because that's what the church wanted. And yeah, we know how to use that. Um, after about six months of using it, they said, actually, can we just get rid of this programmer, please? We just want a switch. That we can just turn it on um, on a time delay switch. Uh, so we, we, we press a button uh, normally when the church warden arrives some 20 minutes before uh, the service starts, uh, they just press a button, it comes on for an hour and a half and then it automatically goes off. So keeping it really simple with the controls um, uh, was something that was, was really um, uh, worthwhile doing uh, in there. Um, so all sorts of other bits and pieces. Direct heaters work well in, in different places, but overhead one up in the tower so that uh, the bell ringers could keep warm. Um, in fact, Matt, the only one that's used there. Yes. Sorry, Matt, can I just interrupt you there a second? Ileana's got their head, hand up. Um, Ileana, did you want to ask a question? Yes, this is all really interesting, Matt. Thank you. I wanted to ask if it's a heat pump that's heating St Andrews or an electric heater. Uh, so it is an electric heater at the church. Uh, it is an electric heater. Uh, so it's all direct electric heating. Um, so all of, all of these panels are just direct electric panels in there. Um, so um, yeah, Thank you. we'll come on to a heat pump in a moment. So yeah, all these are direct electric. And the reason that direct electric has worked really well in both these churches, um, albeit that, that, that um, St. Michael's Willington went through the, the experience of a biomass, it didn't quite work for them, um, is that both of these buildings are used uh, fairly lightly. And it's, it, it's, it's a handful of hours uh, or a couple of handfuls of hours a week um, that these churches are used, definitely less than 10 hours a week. Um, and because of that, the direct electric heating systems have proven to be really highly effective um, and work really well in there. So the, the kind of key point from these really is to understand the usage of those buildings and actually where they're not used very often. Um, so for a few hours a week, this direct electrics worked really well. Um, and neither of these churches has suffered at all from, from not having heating on um, all the time as, as you know, background or conservation heating, uh, call it what you will. Uh, they've not needed that. In fact, neither of them had that in the previous uh, heating systems and they didn't have background heating before um, and they're perfectly okay. They've stood the test of time for many hundreds of years uh, without that. Um, where we do have a heat pump, though, um, is St Andrew's Primary School, uh, also in Chebworth. Um, uh, so I, I, I've included this one uh, really to give that example um, of a heat pump and how uh, they have worked. So I'd say this, uh, this part of the building, uh, the front here, um, is of uh, Victorian age. Um, so it's a whole 
uh, area is in a, a conservation area. Uh, this again had oil fired heating um, uh, to a radiator system and has now very much moved to a completely net zero carbon building. So we've got, um, as you can see, uh, heat pumps uh, that are sitting down there um, and the solar panels actually on the whole roof, which is a more modern extension uh, to the rear of the building. Interestingly, the heat pumps needed planning, the solar panels didn't because uh, they're under mission development. Um, I'll let you make your own views on um, the uh, mission development rules uh, about which one has a greater visual impact, but that's um, an aside. Um, so what this church did, and it's really important that I actually look at the whole project because it really looked at the, the holistic um, uh, issues around heating. So it's not just a heating system. Um, it put up some uh, new ceilings. Obviously, it's a school, so it's you know, modern appearances um, uh, in there. So that helped to reduce the heated air volume um, of the classrooms. And they've got insulation above uh, these ceilings resting on top of the grid um, in there, including new LED lights at the time to reduce the um, consumption. It replaced any single glazed windows with double glazed, including the ones um, within um, uh, stone mullions. Um, and it did this, these are actually the new double glazed units in there. So it did this using steel uh, casements, very much the same design um, uh, and style as the existing ones, but we didn't have cracked single glazed um, panels in there. So from an appearance point of view, it looks very much the same from a thermal um, performance point of view, these are massively better um, at keeping the heat um, within where we had cavity walls in the more modern extensions, they were all insulated. Uh, in the Victorian part of the building, we had a, uh, the, the ground floor is a timber suspended floor, so we had insulation added up in underneath that floor, so we cut a hatch in it and got in underneath and added some insulation up underneath it, so really wrapped up that building well. Um, and then if we go back to the classroom picture, um, it meant that the existing radiators we had, whilst they were the right size for when the building hadn't been brilliantly insulated, they suddenly became oversized. So we actually we didn't need to change these radiators when it came to putting a heat pump um, onto it. Um, and these are the heat pumps. So it's an air to water heat pump system. Um, I will explain a little bit more about those different types of technology in a moment. Um, in there. Uh, so these are the units that sit outside. You can see we've got four of them um, and they sort of one will kick in and then the next one will kick in, um, which is all quite useful from a defrosting point of view uh, in there. that they're, they're sort of installed as a cascade module uh, in there. Um, so these are the units that sit there and these now provide the entirety of the heating for the, the whole of the school. Uh, there is no other backup system. We haven't got a gas boiler. We haven't got an oil boiler. There's nothing else. The entire heating from the school is met by these four um, uh, heat pumps, they're 14 kilowatts each. Um, and inside the old boiler room, all we have now uh, is a few bits and pieces of pipe work uh, coming off the, the heat pumps and going into the heating system and some control panels on the wall. Um, these bits over here are actually to do with the, um, uh, the PV system. So that's all we have. So it's really cleared uh, the, the, the plant now. Um, as mentioned, we have solar panels on the roof um, with uh, a little bit of a battery. If you're interested in what solar panel batteries look like, that's a five kilowatt uh, solar panel battery, uh, just sitting on the floor down there, very small indeed, um, but uh, really does help to balance the usage um, in there. So that's uh, that's uh, school. Um, heating system is now uh, in its third heating season um, uh, and uh, is performing incredibly well. Uh, and, and actually the, the, the school reports that it's, it's improved the comfort of the school um, as well. Maybe that's mainly due to the insulation, but really important that the insulation and the heat pump work together uh, to provide a really efficient school um, in there. Um, I mentioned that we've done a, a wider um, uh, programme um, uh, looking at a number of buildings across the Church of England estate and uh, uh, these were the findings um, uh, from uh, that programme, uh, which said, look, if we look at a holistic view of all the measures that we need to do to save energy and become net zero, um, what do we need to do in different types of buildings um, out there? Um, and uh, yep, there's normal things we know about, like lightings, the windows, um, and everything else. Um, uh, but it was the heat pumps that came out, and this is by cost of measure that's uh, required. The heat pumps by way the most costly measure uh, that was required. Uh, uh, obviously, the, the cost them changes depending on the type of building. So in secondary schools, they've obviously got the biggest systems, therefore they're the biggest overall capital cost um, uh, in there. Um, but it really does go to show where the majority of the money needs to be spent um, in, um, in decarbonizing buildings. It is heat pumps. Um, the other area uh, we need to look at when um, uh, or, or not ignore, I should say, 
um, when looking at decarbonizing buildings um, from their kind of overall thermal point of view um, is that heat is also required into the hot water system. Um, so we need to look at hot water systems as well as heating systems. Often they're linked and they're all come off the same boiler. Um, so we cannot ignore um, the hot water. And often the hot water actually is the, the, the quickest win we can make in terms of helping to reduce uh, the carbon emissions of a building. Um, it's actually if we move the hot water off gas or oil or LPG or whatever else it might be, um, then we don't need to be running those boilers in the summer. Um, and, we, and we can save many, many months of, of carbon emissions. So it's definitely worth thinking about hot water and say often uh, as being the first step um, in decarbonisation. And with, with all the buildings we look at, whatever their usage, um, be it a small church, be it a very large active secondary school, be it an office or um, visitor attraction or, or anything along those lines, um, uh, moving the hot water to an electric point of use system. So rather than generate hot water centrally uh, in a cylinder in the plant room, heated by a boiler or heated directly uh, within a burner at the bottom of the tank. Um, this means that we have a, an electric unit, often a, a square box like this that sits underneath the sinks, um, a slightly larger one sometimes that hung on the wall, um, those sorts of things, um, actually in the area where you need that hot water. So often uh, you might have one of these serving uh, a, a small toilet block for a you know, often male, female disabled um, in, in an office or perhaps a larger one for a visitor attraction. Again, you may have that this unit um, in the cleanest sink that happens to sit in between the two you know, male and female toilets or something like that. Um, uh, so it, it's generating hot water by an electric unit in these, um, these point of use systems very close to where it's needed. Um, and obviously that means that hot water is now being heated by electric rather than by gas or oil or any other fossil fuel um, in there. Interestingly, um, these, um, these systems uh, have actually a much lower Legionella risk. So normally when you're looking at a centralized hot water system, um, HSE requires you to heat that to a minimum of 60 degrees for Legionella protection. Um, with these smaller local um, units, uh, they actually only require it to be heated to 50 degrees. Um, so we're not heating it up uh, to, to uh, that extra 10 degrees for Legionella um, uh, and then cooling it down again to make sure we don't scold people at the tap. Uh, we're actually, we, we, we only need to keep these at 50 degrees. So you've got another um, element in there as well, which is helping uh, save energy um, uh, and, 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 and yeah, uh, everything else going on in there as well. So normally it's to deliver a good cost saving as well. If you do have kitchens, big commercial kitchens, or you have wet sports facilities, um, or you have domestic accommodation where people are taking baths and showers, um, those um, point of use, these sort of smaller units, that's a five litre unit, this is about a 20 litre unit, um, great for hand washing, great for washing up in kitchen sinks and uh, in terms of staff kitchen sink, tea making ones, um, uh, and uh, those kind of bits and pieces. Not so great for, say, that, that big use uh, within the commercial kitchen or, say, if you wanted to run a bath and those kind of things um, don't tend to work quite so well. So you may still need a stored hot water system um, for those kind of areas. And uh, there are some now tanks in the market which look very much like a hot wash tank. If you've ever been in a boiler room and looked at a hot wash tank, this is what they look like. Um, but actually this, this hot wash tank isn't heated by, um, by a gas or a, an oil boiler that's attached to it. Um, it's actually got this top section up here is actually a small dedicated air to air source heat pump. Um, and you notice there are these two little points um, at the top here, and these are air intake uh, and extract uh, units uh, to the heat pump. So it draws its air in through one of these, um, and actually it's advised that the air is drawn in from an internal space, normally the boiler room itself, because that's quite warm air, goes into the heat pump, that concentrates, um, the, extracts the heat out of, of the air that's come into the, the unit, uh, concentrates it and puts it into the water tank here. Um, and then the cooler air, uh, is extracted in a normal way that a flu um, might be extracted from a direct um, gas-fired hot water system. Um, so that's a, a sort of a, very much like a flu, but actually it's just, just blowing cold air out um, of the system after the heat's been extracted from it. Um, so they can be a direct replacement for a hot water tank. They store 200, 220 litres water. Those are the two makes that are on the mainstream market at the moment. Um, so really these are good where we've got big commercial kitchens going on, you know, visitor attractions, those kind of areas. And say, if you've got lots of showering or bathing going on, which is either uh, if you've got a swimming pool and, and wet sports facilities, um, or you've got, got residential accommodation hotels and those kind of things, um, these are what to use instead. Then we come on to the heating systems. 
Uh, and that's really where we're going to start to talk about heat pumps a little bit more as well. Um, the first thing, though, to be said with um, looking at decarbonizing the heating is it makes the most sense, not just commercially, but also environmentally, to really look at the, the time of when you are changing from um, a fossil fuel boiler to a heat pump is when that existing fossil fuel boiler is around about the end of its life. There is no point in ripping out perfectly good um, and probably moderately efficient uh, modern gas and oil systems uh, that may have been only put in in the last five or six years and ripping those out and putting a heat pump. Those, those heating systems have, uh, that are that new uh, still have plenty of life left in them and are probably relatively efficient. We really need to be initially focusing on end of life boilers. Um, and we would expect a gas or oil boiler to be uh, having a life cycle of about 15 to 20 years. Um, there are many older ones on the estate and this is uh, looking at an estate of uh, well over 300 schools uh, where we have some fantastic data on so we can do lots of analysis on that. Um, and this is the distribution of the boiler ages uh, out there. So we've got, you know, the oldest one that dates back to 1983. So we know that we, we've got some boilers around on estates uh, that have been going and being nursed along for many, many years. And really, it's anything over 20 years old where we really need to be looking at uh, replacing these for heat pumps. These are the most inefficient boilers uh, because of their age and technology at the time. Um, and the ones that they've served their life, they've done their useful time now. Uh, and that's where we initially need to be focusing on. We certainly don't need to be refocusing on anything that is, is less than 10 years old. Relax about that. If you've got a, a boiler that's that's 10 years old or less, uh, the time to replace that is not now. And if we're in this middle area, um, that's sort of between 10 and 20 years old, it's probably worth starting to think, well, what would I do about decarbonizing? But it's no panic in terms of you don't need to probably uh, think about uh, replacing that um, right here and now. It's not something that needs to be done this year, but start putting plans in place for what does need to be done. And really, if you've got an end of, oh, got a boiler that's going to be approaching the end of its life or is already out there, the likelihood is you're going to need to replace it for a heat pump. I told you I'd tell you what one of my pet hates is, and that is that the media seems to think that a heat pump is one entity. It's not. There are a huge variety of different types of heat pumps um, and actually decarbonized uh, heating solutions out there. Um, and lots of different types of flavors of heat pumps, and, and they all do slightly different things. Um, so the media are always talk about heat pump, and they would tend to be meaning an air to water source heat pump. So that was the one we had at St. Andrew's Primary School that I showed earlier. Uh, in there. But uh, uh, talking about heat pumps as a single entity is a little bit about talking like transport as a single thing. And we all know that if you want to get from A to B, you could either walk, or you could cycle, or you could take your car, or you could even get a train or, or, or fly. And you would obviously choose which mode of transport about lots of different factors in there, how much you can afford, how quickly you want to get there, how close the two A and B are to each other, et cetera, et cetera. And the same is true of heat pumps as well. We very much need to select the most appropriate type of heat pump for that building, for its requirements and for everything else going on. So I thought I'd very quickly run through what those different types of heat pumps are, um, and how they all work in there as well. Um, and, and we can also uh, talk uh, a little bit about, well, obviously we've already talked a, bit, a little bit about, about biomass. Um, there is now a, uh, what is claimed to be a, um, a net zero carbon um, oil replacement called hydrogenated vegetable oil uh, or HVO um, for short, for obvious reasons. Um, the problem I have with both biomass and HVO is they still do emit carbon dioxide. Um, at the end of their flue gas and a lot of other nasty air pollutants at the same time. So um, are they zero carbon? Not in my book, uh, but there is a large debate about that. Um, and hydrogen is coming through uh, as a fuel. It's a very, very useful fuel. Um, but if we still want to be able to fly, do major um, um, international shipping, have long distance heavy goods vehicles and be able to produce steel, glass, ceramics um, and other high energy um, products, um, then that's where hydrogen needs to go, not into heating our buildings, which do have other solutions out there. So don't hold out the hydrogen as a heating solution for buildings. Uh, it's needed elsewhere. Um, so really then that does mean that we're coming down to heat pumps and a little bit of direct electric heating. So these are sort of the main different types of heat pumps that are out there. 
Um, and the percentages here are their applicability actually into a school estate. You'll notice one here, which seems a little bit odd, which says air source, but type yet to be determined, uh, which seems a very weird type of heat pump. Um, and that is because these are mainly um, in the heating systems, um, which are, are less than 10 years old. And actually, we know that some of these technologies are changing and developing. Um, so we, we, we haven't kind of nailed our colours to the mast in terms of saying, I don't quite know which one it will be yet, because they've still got plenty of year, over years, probably 10 years down the line before they need to be replaced for a heat pump. And we haven't got to make that decision just yet. And it'll be worth looking at the available technology um, when that replacement is required, um, rather than, than fix that, that decision now. So running through the different types of heat pumps that are out there. So, they're all very slightly different uh, and they all work in different ways. So ground and water source heat pumps um, that are out there, um, uh, these very much do what they say in this, the, the, the tin. Uh, they extract heat from either ground or a water source. So um, you are often have deep piles uh, drilled down into the ground. Uh, they can be incredibly deep. They can go down hundreds of meters, um, depending on the geology um, of the ground. Uh, drilled using a massive piling rig, or you can have long trenches, um, which is very useful if you have big playing fields or car parks, uh, all those kind of bits and pieces where you can dig huge long trenches, uh, again, often hundreds of metres uh, long, uh, under some ground, and then obviously make the surface of that good afterwards. Um, and the heat pump extracts that heat from the ground, um, or if it's a water course, um, it could be into a lake or a river or something on those lines. Uh, again, with a uh, kind of a unit uh, there that's extracting the heat. So it extracts the heat from either that ground or that water. Um, and that's quite good because ground and water is, tends to stay at a fairly constant stable temperature all year round. Um, so it takes that heat out of that. Um, and it then brings um, uh, that uh, uh, through a, a, a fluid, uh, brings uh, the, the, the heat from the, the ground or the water into a heat pump unit uh, inside the building. Um, which looks something like that. Um, and what that, that heat pump unit does is it takes that heat and it, it, it compresses it. Uh, so it concentrates um, that heat. Um, uh, and that's what a heat pump essentially does um, from uh, the ground and water uh, loop. And it puts that heat into the heating system of the building, uh, normally through the water that you normally have going around the radiator or something on those lines. Um, heat pumps like this, they do require a bit of internal uh, space um, in a plant room. Um, uh, reference, this is a, uh, a heat pump system inside actually quite a large police station, um, but it's on ground uh, um, ground uh, source heat pump. Um, and heat pumps like this really like to produce heat at around about 45 to 50 degrees in the radiator circuits, in the heating circuit inside the building. So they work particularly well with underfloor heating, because underfloor heating equally wants something at around 45 degrees. Uh, that's the maximum temperature you really run an underfloor heating system up to, perhaps up to 50 maximum um, in there. And that's exactly what heat pumps um, operate at. So underfloor heating and heat pumps um, with um, from a, a ground uh, or water source tend to work particularly well. Um, there's something else with heat pumps that we're going to have to get fairly used to, um, which is uh, what's known as the coefficient of performance. And this is a measure of for every one unit of electricity that goes into these heat pumps, how many units of heat do you get out? Um, so with a ground or a water source, typically, and they all manufacturers and different types of systems vary very slightly, but typically they're around about four units of heat come out for every one unit of electricity you put into the system. So if you wanted to turn around and say it's about 400% efficient, and you wouldn't be wrong. Um, the important thing with coefficients of performance is it's looked at over a seasonal, uh, over a whole heating season, over a whole year, um, uh, really, uh, because obviously temperatures vary. Um, so uh, you'd have this little S at the front of it, so it's known as an S-COP or a SCOP, um, and that's really what you want to be looking at in, in there. Technically, you can just look at uh, how, how well it works in the lab, and that often doesn't have that S on the top of it, um, but that gives you a slightly warped view. So really you want to be looking at the seasonal coefficient of performance, how it operates in real life in there. So ground and water source, because it's got this stable temperature, um, then uh, they uh, have this sort of about, uh, the, the cop of about four in there. Works very well with new builds, um, or for large estates where we've got a big amount of land or lakes or those kind of things, they're easily available there. 
constricted town center sites which are already existing very very difficult uh, to find the room and everything else with and if you've got big archaeology uh, around um, these do cause massive disruption into ground um, so and that can be a big problem if we've got, got archaeology uh, in that don't really tend to work with that so if we don't want to be messing up the ground uh, and all that kind of thing um, then air to water uh, source heat pumps uh, come in um, again these are extracting heat, but rather from the ground or from the water, they're extracting it from the air. They're concentrating, compressing that heat again and putting into water uh, system running around the heating system. So exactly the same as the ground or water source one, uh, but rather than coming from uh, a stable environment, um, which is obviously the ground or water, this is taking it from the outside air. So air flows through these units. Um, the heat within that air uh, is extracted concentrated and put into to the water sources system that then goes around the radiators um, or other such uh, heating emitters inside the building. Um, again, produces about 50 degree heat. That's where heat pumps like to be operating that sort of level uh, in there. Um, some things to watch out for though, you do need a good flow rate around your internal pipework system um, to be able to just flow that heat around quite quite easily and quite well. Um, so uh, it doesn't work if you've got very small diameter um, uh, pipework. So if you have micro ball pipe work, um, or if you've got a single pipe system, so rather than have a flow and return, you've only got one pipe going into your radiators. Um, it doesn't really work with either of those systems. So if you had either of those, you will need to replace all of the pipe work inside the building. And obviously that's a, a massive uh, amount of disruption and within that. If you've got flow and return of pipe work, um, normally the pipe work uh, will work fine in there um, there's minimal internal plants so if you've got constricted space inside this can be quite useful but there obviously is large external plant in there um, because it's extracting heat from the air rather than the more stable environments of ground or water uh, its efficiency is slightly less we're typically seeing s-tops are around about three and a half so three and a half units of heat um, for every one unit of electricity that goes in you do uh, tend to need to have large um, often called oversized radiators uh, and those kind of things, um, because obviously the, the flow rate is 50 degrees rather than the sort of 75 that a boiler would normally be used to. So we just need a bigger surface area to get that heat out into the building. Um, but you can, what I term, virtually oversize your radiators by making the installation in the building uh, higher. Uh, the, the, the same size radiator then it becomes oversized because the heat loss of that, uh, that room or whatever is less. Um, so sometimes you can actually retain your existing radiators, and as I was described in the school earlier, that's exactly what we did there. However, if you've got um, issues where a 50 degree circulating heat is not, not going to work, uh, we can't increase the radiator size, as often we have in heritage buildings, uh, the radiators themselves have got a heritage value in some cases, um, we really don't want to go, we've got uh, problems with our pipework system and we really don't want to go to this disruption of changing all of that. There are heat pumps on the market which are high temperature uh, heat pumps. Um, so these are high temperature air to water source heat pumps. Um, work exactly the same as the um, air to water source heat pump, but they go through a second unit uh, which sits inside um, and that provides a second level of concentration of the heat. Um, so we get um, uh, from the air source heat pumps going into this unit at 50 degrees. This unit then concentrates that heat for a second time. Uh, technically, it's a water to water source heat pump um, and then produces temperatures coming out of that at around about 75 degrees. So exactly the same as boilers, which is really useful because we don't now need to worry about so many issues about increasing radiator sizes and like, is your pipe work suitable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in there. These really are operating as direct replacement for boilers because they produce that 75 degree heat. The problem is because we've now got two uh, heat pump processes going on, we've got one in the air to air and one in this internal unit, the efficiency goes right down. So we're now down to, to uh, an S-COP of about two and a half um, in there. And it does need both external space for these units and internal space for those units. Um, they are playing around with that uh, and different units out there uh, and now putting all of those units outside, but obviously that's a bigger unit outside uh, going on in there. There's a huge amount of development going on in this space. This high temperature air to water is probably the largest area where we've got technological development going on 
um, at the moment. Um, and if you, you want to check out some units um, where there's, there's really interesting development going on, um, then I've just put a link down there to some interesting new products. I'm not promoting that product at all. I'm just saying it's quite an interesting one to have a look at uh, in there because um, people do get concerned about the noise um, on these uh, units. Uh, the smaller units are actually really not a problem from noise. Some of the bigger ones, uh, we just need to, to, to be careful about it. Um, uh, it can be managed really easily. Um, and uh, also this has refrigerant gases in it. Um, we can use the refrigerant gas to go from these external units into the internal unit. Um, and refrigerant gases have their own set of problems uh, around uh, global warming potentials and those kind of things. Um, but there are some gases that are far better than others. Um, so some actually use carbon dioxide as a refrigerant gas. Um, and that works really well. Um, and actually, interestingly, has a, a relatively low uh, global warming potential um, in there. So it's a, a much better gas to use. So um, just highlight those products in there. Um, the other big form of heat pump that barely gets a mention, um, uh, but actually is really, really extensively used, is air-to-air -air source heat pumps. Um, and you would all know these. They're basically an air conditioning system running in heating mode. Um, so they'll extract air from the outside in these systems, put it into a refrigerant gas. That's the big difference. Um, the refrigerant gas comes into an inside unit uh, where it's allowed to expand again. That emits heat. And you've got a little fan that blows that heat out into the space. Um, that is essentially how an air conditioning system works. Um, uh, and these work really well. They're hugely efficient, much more efficient than, than, than other things. So they've got an S-COP around four. They can cool, and actually that's what has been used as their uh, predominant um, feature for, for decades up to now, um, is their conditioning systems are cool. So they can still cool as well as heat in there because it's got a fan on it. They tend to warm up spaces really quickly as well. So 20 minutes or so. This is a really mature, very, very well-developed solution, well-established supply chains, um, uh, <laughs> works really well. And we're seeing this as a major form of decarbonized heating going forward. So whilst a lot of the talk is about air to water stuff, air to air systems really shouldn't be ignored. And probably over half of the buildings that we have out there would really suit an air to air system in there. Same issues with refrigerant gases, we just need to take care on that. Um, and also how they're controlled. We obviously don't want to be installing these things. And then all the users suddenly use them for air conditioning and cooling lots and lots of times because your energy consumption is going to go uh, up massively. Um, we really want to them to be used for heating only and perhaps only be used for cooling in those times of high heat stress as we had uh, in the summer just gone in there but that can all be sorted out with fairly simple control measures people tend to get worried about these um air to air systems in terms of what the heat emitters look like inside because normally people are familiar to seeing these things uh less than attractive units um uh, hung off ceilings uh, everywhere, which look fine in a modern office block, but really not in a heritage environment. Uh, all these white boxes that are bolted onto the walls of, I'm sure, many meeting rooms you sat in with a little bit of a flappy uh, bit of plastic at the bottom. Again, not the most attractive things, um, but there are ground or floor mounted units uh, that are almost identical uh, to um, uh, fan convectors, uh, radiator uh, type units. Uh, so in, in identical, in fact, I have actually uh, misinterpreted uh, uh, what one of these units was uh, in a building that I was auditing. And I'm fairly used to looking at these things and I had to go back and go, oh, actually, it's slightly different than I thought. They are that similar in their appearance. They go where you expect a radiator to be, um, which means they do tend to fit in with heritage environments much better uh, in this format. Um, and again, some of the developments we are seeing in this area is not how the technology works. The technology has been there for donkey's years. Um, it's the attractiveness and the design of these internal units and how they work inside. Um, direct electric heating shouldn't be ignored. Um, as I mentioned, both those churches uh, that I showed as a case study uh, use direct electric heating and all sorts of different formats um, that could be used in different spaces. Some work in big open plan spaces far better than others. Some are trying to be more attractive. I'll let you decide on the attractiveness of some of those out there but direct electric should not be ignored um, it can certainly be a, a solution and very much for those buildings that are used um, a little bit less frequently it can be a very good solution indeed um, i can't really do a talk on energy at the moment without talking about energy prices um, and they are moving massively um, and we're now going to go do a little bit of maths um, uh, into this because what's really important about um, cost issues uh, when moving to uh, from away from uh, particularly away from gas um, uh, into a uh, heat pump, which obviously uses electric. Um, everybody sort of turns around and goes, ah, yeah, but electric costs an awful lot more than that gas does. 
Um, and that is exactly true. Um, so on historic prices, those that we were paying uh, in the market kind of 18 months ago, um, we have typically paying about three pence a kilowatt hour of gas, about 15 pence a kilowatt hour of electricity. The ratio between those is electricity was five times more expensive than gas was. Now this caused a bit of a problem for heat pumps because even the best heat pump out there, uh, my air to air source heat pump, um, the, the coefficient of performance, remember that's again a measure of um, uh, how many units of electric you're using uh, to produce one unit of heat, that was only four and a half. So it would cost more to run a, um, a heat pump than it would be to run a gas boiler because the ratio here was five and this was only four and a half at the best. And obviously if you're using air to water source systems, um, as the media often talks about them as being heat pumps, um, much lower, which is why you get a lot of these comments going, ah, yes, but these heat pumps cost more to run. They certainly did. However, energy prices have changed massively as I'm sure everybody is acutely aware of. And one of those changes is that actually the ratio between gas and electricity has shifted. So gas has actually increased in price much more quickly than electricity has increased in price. I can talk about why and actually why electricity shouldn't be increased in price as much as it has, but whatever, um, another day. Um, so but the main thing to notice is the ratio, and this is now the cap price we're paying under the government's um, uh, energy price cap scheme. So that's the, 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 the price sort of roughly in the market at the moment. Uh, that ratio has changed to, to 3.2. And you'll notice now suddenly all of these heat pumps, apart from the high temperature air to water heat pump, have now got a better coefficient of performance than the ratio between gas and electricity. That means these heat pumps are now cheaper to run than a good efficient gas boiler. And where the market's going, uh, crystal ball time, um, it looks like that, that ratio is going even closer in there. But of course, it's not just gas. Um, we also have oil and LPG to think about. And uh, because oil and uh, LPG cost an awful lot more, um, I should change that to thermal, um, uh, per kilowatt hour than uh, mains gas do, um, the ratios with oil and LPG are even lower again, which starts to make even a high temperature air to water system um, uh, looking actually to be um, uh, producing financial savings in there as well. So that's just a note of where that's going. What does this mean for buildings? Really, uh, we need to be thinking about how we can insulate them. Uh, we need to be thinking about avoiding using gas and oil for both heating and hot water. That's going to look like direct electric heating for the majority of hot water units. It's going to mean heat pumps for the majority of boiler systems, or if the building's only used a small amount of time, then perhaps looking at direct electric heating. If you've got district heating networks, these are the big things that run around cities, um, very common in like big cities like New York, but we do have them in the UK as well, um, then that's a great choice, but obviously uh, they are quite rare um, to have in there. We've got to be thinking about reducing the electrical demand um, as well as, because uh, heat pumps are using more electricity. So how can we save that elsewhere and LED lighting and um, good pumps and all those kind of bits and pieces are a really good area to look at reducing the electrical demand and making very significant savings in there. You may need to look at increasing your electricity supply to run heat pumps. So if you particularly if you've only got a single phase supply, that's probably going to need to be upgraded. And depending on how much insulation you can put in your building and how big your radiators are, you may need to look at increasing the radiator sizes in there as well. And if you can, generating some of that electricity you need from solar uh, panels uh, makes a very big financial difference in there. It could mean that buildings can then be very much cheaper to run over their whole overall energy costs than they have been in the past. Uh, in terms of funding out there for these types of things, there are bits and pieces of funding, but they're very narrow um, in there. So if you've got a public sector building, um, so a school, a hospital, a police station, all those kind of uh, bits and pieces, there is a public sector scheme uh, that is uh, paying for some of the costs uh, of heat pumps to go into um, buildings. Uh, that is like it will certainly continue next year. And the autumn statement announced that will continue um, uh, for the next three years after 23 as well. So that's going to be running forward. Um, there's a boiler upgrade scheme for domestic properties. This is the scheme that will pay uh, £5,000 for replacing a fossil fuel boiler for a heat pump and make that contribution in there. Um, that will only cover a marginal amount of the additional cost, it won't cover all of it, um, but is, is, is useful, better than nothing. Um, we are seeing uh, some changes going on with the funding towards insulation measures. Um, so previous years, that's really been only directed at those people 
uh, in domestic properties that are on benefits, that is opening up a little bit more. Um, so you can now fund insulation in domestic properties uh, from what's known as Eco4 Plus, um, uh, with properties that are in the lower council tax bands in Wales, uh, and this was run by the Welsh um, uh, branch. Uh, so in Wales, that's council tax bands A to C. Um, it's slightly different uh, in England, which is council tax bands A to D, and in Scotland, it's different again, and I can't immediately remember what those bands are. Um, uh, so that's uh, the council tax bands, and has got an EPC rating, that's Energy Performance Certificate, um, of uh, D or less, or if it's a, a, a private rented property, uh, if it needs to be E or less. Um, so that scheme is currently on consultation and is due to come out spring next year to pay for insulation within domestic properties. Doesn't matter whether that's um, uh, you're a private landlord or a social landlord or whatever else, um, uh, all domestic properties will be able to get that in there. Um, and that's really the only funding uh, that we have specifically coming from government at the moment for these kind of things. There are commercial financing systems in there that work well for PV systems and LED uh, because the paybacks are so good, um, but less so for heat pumps in there. Um, so just sort of concluding on that, um, uh, all of those bits and pieces together, we can deliver net zero carbon buildings uh, today. If you've got a likely used building, I say, you know, uh, um, uh, those two churches I showed at the beginning, uh, moving direct electric heating solutions works and it works really very well. If you've got a daily use building, um, so far more frequently, you're likely to have to look at a heat pump um, and really do think about the whole variety of heat pumps out there. And remember that air to air heat pump, so i.e. an air conditioning system, um, is a really important solution um, that we have in there. But we've got to look at the building in the complete round. So make sure you're looking at insulation, make sure you're considering how that building's used, make sure you're thinking about people, their comfort. That's really important in there. How are you making people comfortable in that building? Um, uh, in there and really think about that building holistically, not just the technology um, uh, points that might be going on in the boiler room. Um, and I really just wanted to finish with, with the thought, we got all the solutions we need today. Um, we've done them. There are lots of really good real life case studies um, out there. We can deliver net zero carbon um, today. Uh, the decisions that we need to make is to never install a gas or oil heating or hot water system ever again in our lives. Thank you very much. And I will take all sorts of questions. And I've seen them streaming through on chat. So uh, hopefully you've both been keeping an eye on those as we go through. I have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. There's so much information there. And your use of um, the pictures as well was really, really helpful because to me, maybe it's just me, but they all sort of look the same. <laughs> but uh, excuse me. But yeah, that, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, right, I will start right back at the start. John was the first person to ask a question and they said, my church is in use 100 hours a week and all electricity based heating systems are outrageously expensive to run at the moment between 11,000 and 17,000 a month. How are these churches finding the ongoing costs with the current energy prices? So yeah, all, all energy, as I said in those, that energy price slide, um, has gone up and gas has gone up more than electricity. So um, it's, you know, there is no good news uh, in, in that area um, and there's no easy win from that. Where the church is used that frequently, direct electric heating systems are going to be more expensive to run because they're just running for so long. Um, the advantage of direct electric heating systems is uh, when they're... Uh, they, they heat people up very quickly um, when they're on, and then you can turn them off very quickly afterwards. Um, if you've got a building that's used a long period of time, um, uh, they, they do become very expensive to run. So really then you've got to be looking at those heat pumps um, and those different types of heat pumps, um, as I mentioned, uh, depending on what would suit that building, um, will have different financial measures of, of uh, whether they'll be cheaper to run, but most are now on a par with, a, with an efficient gas boiler out there. So sorry, they're not going to give you any big financial saving from a gas boiler, um, but they, they do now cost a similar amount to run uh, on the new energy prices. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Um, Ed had a question, and I think this popped up when you showed the picture of the um, under pew heaters, mm -hmm. I think. So correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, but they've asked, were there any negative effects on the pews observed, for example, cracking? Yeah, no, not at all. And the um, the latest faculty um, uh, rules from uh, Church of England 
Um, I'll get those off there. Um, but are they should only be installed to I think it's pews that date after 1850. So I wouldn't include, I wouldn't attach these to medieval pews because not least you've got um uh, some screws on the brackets that have to screw into the timber. Um uh, but also for, for those reasons of um historic timber. Um uh, you can see these ones here, they, they actually sit on an L-shaped bracket. You can hopefully just about see that um on these two brackets there. Um so actually the the hot or hotter unit um of heat. It's actually got lots of air around it, uh, so there's not in direct contact with the timber, so we've seen no problems um, at all with those units. Um, these ones actually scroll onto the pew backs, um, these are slightly more flimsy. Um, again, we've not actually experienced any issues with that at all, um, but I could see that this type of heater may be, you just want to be slightly more cautious with, with what you're screwing up to, because the, the heat hot element of that is in direct, well, not quite in direct contact, but much closer to the timber. Um, uh, in there. These are also low surface temperature units, so they only heat up to um, uh, about 80 degrees surface temperature. Uh, so a similar 75, uh, similar uh, to a radiator wood. Um, so they've got the same issues as, as, as a radiator wood. Great, thanks. Um, Naya, ask, apologies Naya if it, that's the wrong pronunciation. Um, they've asked what type of battery was used? Uh, I'm not sure when when that popped up. So that Naya, was I don't know. for the um, the PV system at the school. Oh, I've got to go in the right way. Um, so this was. Let me just get it up. Uh, this battery unit uh, sitting here. Um, these are the two inverters. Um, and that's the battery unit. Uh, this one was actually the first of its type. Um, and I, I've been assured it hasn't got any spyware in it. It's actually a Huawei <laughs> battery. Um, so um, uh, it, it, it's Chinese inverter. Um, uh, they've, um, yeah, there's some particularly interesting things to do with the electrical arrangement here, uh, which you, uh, is, is electrical geek stuff. So I'm not going to go into it. Uh, <laughs> but it meant that that system worked really well. Um, and these batteries also tend to be modular. Um, so we can actually um, stack another battery on top of this or to the side of it and link them all together if we ever wanted to expand it. Um, but yeah, battery technology is growing really fast. It's actually maturing at quite a pace at the moment. So the biggest... Um, uh, kind of manufacturer of PV ancillaries, so inverters and, and those kind of bits and pieces, um, uh, Solar Edge um, have introduced um, a new battery system into the UK in the last kind of nine months or so. Um, so we're seeing that developing at quite a pace. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Ed's asked what insulation was used on the solid walls of the Victorian school building? So we didn't actually insulate the solid walls of the Victorian school building. We only insulated the cavity walls and uh, we changed the windows. So actually, uh, that one, uh, these, these are the solid walls on the Victorian um, part of the building. Obviously those cavity walls are less attractive. Uh, 1970s extension, I think that one is. Um, <laughs> so yeah, these solid walls here, we didn't uh, insulate at all. And we actually found they performed pretty well from a thermal point of view. So we made sure the rainwater goods were in good condition. So they were dry. And actually a dry solid wall isn't actually that bad. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's what yeah. I thought you were going to say. So that's fantastic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. The, the, the windows were by far and away the biggest weak point. So changing the windows made all the difference. We didn't need such walls. Right stuff. Um, Mike said, um, "Don't air-to-air -air heat pumps working in an internal space work against your efforts to heat the same space for its occupants?" Don't air-to-air -air something working against efforts to heat the same space for occupants. Don't Mike. Yeah. Mike, are you there? It might be better if you unmute yourself. Hi, hi, can you hear me at all? Yes, we can. Right. I'm just thinking that the whole point of extracting air, air from one lot of air to concentrate into another into another air supply. I mean, if you've taken the heat out of out of the general environmental air, then if the space is being occupied by people at the same time, then they're going to feel it colder, aren't they? Uh, yeah, so the air to air units are the, you still have an external unit, so you're extracting the heat, these, Oh, whilst they're out of water, would be exactly the same units that they're out of air. Um, okay. So they're extracting the heat from outside air and moving that heat, concentrating it and moving it into the inside space. So we're not we're not taking uh, okay heat from the only one which we are great. we are looking at internal um, um, 
uh, extraction of um, yeah, having, having using internal air is for this hot water system, and that's uh, advised to take the internal air out from the boiler room itself. And obviously, that's not an occupied space. Uh, okay, that's the, the context I was specifically thinking yeah. of when I made that yeah. comment. Yes, um, and that actually blows its air out um, externally through a duct. Um, right. Uh, so it gets rid of its cold air, which is almost the opposite way around. Um, mm -hmm. but because it's extracting its warm air from the boiler room, uh, we're kind of almost um, kind of recovering waste heat. Uh, yes, exactly. It might make it more comfortable for people who actually have to go into the boiler room at the time. We try and make boiler rooms not that warm by insulating them well, but you never succeed entirely. So, yeah. Okay, then. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Um, Jay Archibald has asked if you can show the outdoor units again for St Andrews, please. I certainly can. Uh, I think they flick up. There you go. That's the outside units for St Andrews. Um, so that's... Uh, the picture of them we've sort of stood up on ladders to actually take uh, uh, that picture uh, down onto them. So yeah, there are four units there. And I say these these are air to water source heat pumps, but they look very much identical for air to air source uh, heat pump units um, as well. Um, it, it was more the a distance shot that you had yeah. um, uh, where you had the whole school. That one. Yes, 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 please. Thank you. Yes. So, yeah, and we're circulating these slides, I think, afterwards, aren't we, Bev? The slides will be going around afterwards, I think. So if you would... Oh, want, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so th th this picture will be on those slides, so you can you can study that one. Um, uh, interesting, we chose to locate these on the ground because uh, actually the boiler room is just up in here, so it's quite a useful space. Uh, there was actually a flat roof area, and we very much did debate about locating them on this flat roof because there's a kind of a hidden bit of roof in between, between these two roofs and actually walk down there on a flat bit of roof. Um, so we could have tucked them up in, in behind there, um, but they ended up going there um, for various reasons um, uh, uh, for that. But yeah, um, that's, that's where they are. Brilliant. Um, Adrian said, uh, ground water source um, HP, I would be interested in hearing more about this, especially as I live in a mining area. And I understand that the water which has now flooded these are an excellent source of heat. Um, should Adrian get in touch with you, Matt, to find out more or could you point them? Uh, yeah, I can certainly point them in the right direction. So he wants to get in touch. And uh, yes, there's a very specific um, piece that um, mine water um, uh, heating is, is, is very much a thing, a specific obviously to those mining environments. Um, but there are some big case studies. If he wants to get in touch, I can point him. Um, uh, to and in fact there's some very big schemes uh, that are being looked at to extract heat from mine water and put it into a district heating system and send it around the entire kind of communities which is really interesting stuff uh, wow. but very very specific obviously to to that area um, and ground water uh, ground um, source heat pumps also um, can be very useful depending on different geologies um, so sometimes the kind of the older volcanic rock areas so um, Place at Cornwall, for example, uh, where they've actually got warmer rocks uh, beneath them. Southampton actually uses one of those types of systems. Brilliant. Thank you. That sounds really interesting. Um, Sheena um, has said, please advise if any heat pumps are most appropriate to small heritage terraced houses with yards in terms of space and noise. Yeah. Um, so, interestingly, domestically um you tend to either be going for um the air to water uh units um into a traditional radiator system um, and if it's a small house that you can probably do some insulation to um then uh they would tend to work quite effectively um so that, that's sort of yeah very much those systems although i say this is um this is a system for a primary school so really domestically you probably need one of these units um uh, to be working away uh, and interestingly, the air-to-air -air systems, um, these ones, increasingly being used domestically. Um, and there's actually a unit on here I didn't show, uh, which is one that tries to look a little bit more um, uh, domestic type rather than commercial type uh, to go into bedrooms and those kind of bits and pieces. Um, uh, so if you've got a yard, you can obviously locate the external unit outside there, depending on the uh, visual impact of that. Um, and these smaller units, um, so these ones are, can be a little bit noisy, but these smaller units, these sort of very small ones you see lurking around, um, 
they are now so quiet um, that they don't really cause any noise issue at all. Um, so most of them are, are kind of what we call whisper quiet. Um, so there's sort of library background noise levels. Um, so there is, there is a small amount of noise to it, but it's very much like the noise that comes off your fridge or freezer when that's running. Uh, and obviously that sits in your kitchen, it probably doesn't disturb you that much. And this would sit outside. So um, that's the sort of noise level you, you're, you're, you're seeing from these smaller units. Noise comes an issue with when it comes up to a larger unit. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Paolo's asked, um, did you experience any issue when upgrading from a single phase to a three phase system? Here in London, some boroughs have been issued warnings that the power grid might struggle with electrification of heat. Hence, some developments will need to stick to gas for the time being. Yep. Um, so we didn't in, in terms of where that uh, project was located. Um, uh, we didn't, uh, three phase was available. Um, and actually we, we weren't trying to pull through a massive um, like connection. So there's only a hundred amp three phase. Um, uh, so that was fine. The issues we had were actually it's an underground supply and we had to dig across a, a, a graveyard. So it was all archeological was, was the issues on that one. Um, I am aware, cause I do work with Met Police uh, about the London power grid issues. Um, they tend to be very localized um, so that there are issues. Um, uh, they, they're, they're, they're much larger in London than they are in most other places, but it does tend to be a um, uh, sort of city centre um, or, or yeah, more urban areas where there's been a lot of development in recent times and the, basically the grid infrastructure hasn't kept up with it. Um, and it tends to be sort of focused around Pacific um, uh, transformers, uh, which have become overloaded. Um, so I'm aware that uh, UK Power Networks in London is... Um, is struggling in certain key areas and we can literally go from one borough to another um, and one borough is absolutely fine no problems at all and the next borough it's a complete nightmare um, and if we want uh, a decent amount um, I say with my dealings with Met Police we're not only trying to do heat pumps we're also trying to do some very high powered electric vehicle charging um, and you combine the two of those together we need a much bigger supply um, I say some transformers absolutely fine other ones we're talking millions of pounds to upgrade so yeah but they, they do tend to be concentrated in urban environments. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, Ileana, they've got their hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you very much. It was back to the previous question that somebody asked, and, and Matt, you mentioned a bit on it, so I was reflecting on domestic properties and thinking about whether it's best to go for air-to-air -air or air-to-water. What would your thoughts be on that? Is it that, for example, air-to-air -air you need a different kind of radiator and that's got its own cost how would you decide on what's best and what's cheapest to run it and so on yeah i would say both are valid and it will always come down to that individual um uh case um in there um uh, air to water if you've got under floor heating systems in your building it, air to water is the obvious choice um if you've got a good um uh, existing heating uh, pipe work and um, radiators, either the radiators are either quite large or they can be quite easily upgraded. Um, you tend to be a slightly more towards the air to water. Um, where you've got problems that you've got a single pipe system um, or you've got microbore pipe work um, and you go, oh, this will, it, if I'm going air to water, I'm now going to need to replace the entirety of all my pipe work and all my radiators. Um, air to water becomes less viable and therefore you tend to go more to air to air. Um, interestingly, we're seeing a greater increase in air to air systems in domestic buildings uh, following last summer because they can cool as well. So um, I've seen a number of domestic um, installations where they put air to air upstairs, they can cool in bedrooms. Um, and they've used air to water downstairs, particularly when they've had underfloor heating systems existing on the on, on the ground floor, um, but not on the first floor. Um, so you can mix and match in there as well. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of flavour about how to make some of those judgments, but it will come down to an individual assessment in each building. Um, and sometimes it comes down to, to kind of occupant preference as well. Um, so uh, people that... that um, uh, suffer more from um, uh, heat stress or, or, or a 
just hot people and need to cool down more. Uh, and I'm not going to mention anything about age or genders at all. I'm going to steer well clear of that one. Um, uh, but some of those really do value the cooling uh, uh, potential of, of, of air-to-air systems. So it can be, um, can be very useful and, and might be the selling point for them to decarbonise. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Um, Naya has said, how would you account for embodied carbon? Now, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, Naya, and, and explain that a, a little bit more. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if, if you don't know the specifics of the schematics of a building because it's quite old and you're unsure how it would be, you know, it's it, it would be preserved. So would it just be negligible as in body carbon would be maybe? I don't know. Yeah, so in body carbon, um, uh, for those who haven't heard the phrase before, is, is the amount of um, uh, carbon that's gone into um, making uh, the, um, uh, the materials and, 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 and the kit. Um, uh, of a sort of construction project or, or, or any product whatsoever. Um, if you want to read a fascinating book on it, there's, there's a book called How About Add Our Bananas, uh, written by Mike Berners-Lee, who's the um, uh, brother of um, Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the internet. Um, so um, yeah, brilliant book to read, very entertaining. If you haven't got it, put it in your Christmas list and hopefully Father Christmas will bring it to you because it's, it's a great, easy read book. Um, all about embodied carbon of different products. Um, anyway, the, the, so the two important things here are, one, it's uh, my point about not replacing um, uh, boilers that still got plenty of life left in them. Um, uh, so don't replace those too early is, is mainly because of embodied carbon. So a lot of energy went into making those boilers uh, in the first place. So if we rip them out, we're, we're basically uh, not using the, 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 the energy that went into making those systems. Um, uh, wisely so that's why it's kind of one of the reasons it's good to leave them in um the main bit of uh, thing to know about embodied carbon is uh from a kind of particularly from a construction project point of view um there's a really strong relationship between how heavy something is and how much embodied carbon um it's got in it um so things like concrete steel and glass are really heavy products and have got really high embodied carbon to them things like light fittings and actually even these heat pump units are actually relatively light um, uh, and therefore they're not that high from their embodied carbon point of view. So when we look at decarbonisation products, um, firstly reuse or making an existing building have a greater purpose and making sure it's fit for purpose going forward is really good because we're not knocking down that building and rebuilding it. Massive savings from embodied carbon from that point of view and the sorts of things we're doing to decarbonise it um, don't tend to have high embodied carbon um, features unless we're looking at the two areas to just watch out for are solar panels and replacement windows because it's the glass in those that has the highest embodied carbon component. So those are the areas you probably want to be just a little bit more aware of it. Um, but other than that, most products are really low in terms of their body carbon. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. And I know that um, Historic England have recently been running quite a few webinars on the, the topic of embodied carbon. So if you just Google Historic England embodied carbon, carbon, I'm sure quite a few of them will come up. They're really interesting. Um, just to big up as well, um, it's Historic England have recently issued a really good paper on heat pumps as well that goes through the different types of heat pumps that I've kind of run through uh, in a bit more detail. So do look up that resource. It's, it's, it's very good. Brilliant. Um, Fiona's asked, is there a solution for individual flats in old stone tenement buildings? Now, Fiona's from Fife Historic Buildings Trust. Yeah, so um, individual um, flats, particularly sort of uh, where you've got uh, flats on a number of floors or you've sort of split up a building um, uh, in there can be a particular challenge because you don't really want to have one centralised system serving all the flats together because if one's occupied and the other's not, or different times, et cetera, it can all uh, lose its efficiency very quickly. So um, uh, again, we sort of would probably tend to go slightly more towards air-to-air -to -air systems in there because they can work directly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so you've got one system for each flat um, in there. It's going to uh, depend on uh, how easy it is to locate the external units um, on those because um, we've probably all seen those pictures, particularly of... Um, 
uh, very densely occupied urban situations in kind of East Asia, where they've got this just the walls are just covered in in air conditioning systems. We clearly don't want to be ending up with that. So the placement of the external unit is going to be the, uh, the tricky bit to get right. Um, but if you can hide those discreetly, then it's probably going to be an air to air solution. Great stuff. Um, still a few more questions to go. Uh, Paul's asked, are modern biomass boilers with auto feeds any more reliable than the first generation models? Um, uh, I wouldn't say there's actually been any massive development in technology um, uh, between sort of where we were kind of 15 years ago to where we are now on biomass boilers. There has been improvements in understanding the design of it. Um, so with biomass feeds, what we really want is one simple straight line without trying to bend it around corners or whatever, let gravity do the, the majority of the work and actually using a corkscrew, so an auger system in one straight line from the bottom of the, um, the store of the pellet, um, pellet store straight into the boiler without going around corners is the system that fails the least. They do still fail. They do still require maintenance in there. Um, so um, we can't, yeah, I think the design of them, the feed systems got better as you've understood those issues. Um, and also the understanding that really you probably do need trained site uh, managers, caretakers, call them what you want to, um, uh, but someone on site who's there pretty much on a daily basis, you can just keep an eye on it and can, can prevent problems happening because they know they can go into that hatch, clean out the dust, and therefore it all carries on running smoothly. That's really where the development's been in the understanding rather than necessarily in technology. Great stuff, thank you. Um, Adrian's asked about the insulation of the school building. Now this was the one that you said it wasn't insulated, was it? You changed the windows. Yeah, so sol solid wall uh, insulation, we didn't need to, it's only the windows in there. Um, uh, and obviously we just use standard cavity wall insulation in the sort of 1970s cavities. Um, but if you are looking at types of solid wall insulation, the natural materials, a lot of studies out there, um, some of them done on Cornish historic buildings, some done in the Scottish um, historic buildings, uh, both have got um, <laughs> either end of the country, don't know why, um, but they've got really good research uh, papers on them, have tended to show the natural materials, so either hemp or cork tend to come out um, uh, particularly well um, for uh, good insulation on historic properties and obviously getting the breathability um, on those is is very important so the natural materials tend to perform much better. Brilliant. Uh, Thomas, is that this is my last question here so if anybody wants to unmute themselves in a minute then please do. Um, Thomas has said is there an argument to consider limiting internal temperatures to provide background heating of say 15 or 16 degrees and then expect the occupants to dress appropriate, appropriately primarily in buildings listed as ancient monuments which have limited opportunity for improvement of insulation and glazing. Um, huh. yeah. There, there is a case for that. Um, and interestingly, if we look over to uh, Europe um, uh, in terms of current sort of energy issues over there, uh, you'll notice things like um, France, for example, have said that schools should only be heated to 19 degrees and everybody should just put an extra jumper on. Um, so there is a case for that. I'd say 15 or 16 is probably a little bit on the low side. 18, 19 is probably uh, where we want to be. And uh, often we're heating our buildings in the UK to... Um, uh, we ought to only be heating them up to 21, but often we're heating up to 23 or more. Um, so there is definitely a case for that, although government has zero appetite to uh, legislate around that. Um, so it's going to be down to personal uh, preferences um, in there. And interesting, I think where we come to um, uh, some of those listed um, and things as like ancient monuments in their uh, buildings, it depends on what function you've got going on inside that. So if for visitors in the visitor attraction where they're walking in from the outside and they can leave their coats on and walk through and they're remaining fairly active um, you can absolutely get temperatures down to that level or even lower um, in there if you're trying to get people to sit at their desk and work in those buildings all day long for eight hours the comfort level needs to be warmer um, but that's not to say you couldn't just background your um, heat your buildings to that sort of level and then provide the 
that person that sat there for a long period of time with some form of uh, immediate direct heating. So there's some really interesting stuff on heated seat cushions. Uh, so really good products out there like that. Um, and some of those direct um, electric heaters uh, that we've got out there, go back to that slide. So these sorts of heaters you can hang if you've got somebody, let's say you've got um, a volunteer in a, in a visitor attraction who's standing in a similar sort of place, um, uh, having a little uh, local electric heater um, to provide them with the thermal comfort they need uh, can be another good way as well. Um, you can even get heated coats and heated insoles to go in shoes and all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, so yeah, you just need to give the thought to if people are in there for a long period of time and less active, um, they will need to have some degree of thermal comfort given to them above those levels and probably above just adding another jump up. As an aside as well, um, we've recently had a, a blog post from our partner members, Hayes Parsons, the insurance brokers, um, and they have advised anybody that's thinking of doing that sort of thing to check your insurance policy first because there's all sorts of implications but I'll find the link to that blog post and I'll, I'll post it in the chat box. Um, Jay Ledbetter has said can you repeat which research showed best insulation for heritage buildings please? Yeah there's two bits of research one is done on Cornish buildings and another is done on Scottish buildings I will dig out the Pacific references and Bev if I send them to you perhaps you can circulate yeah. those references with the slides. Um, yeah, no problem. I can't immediately recall the exact reference so I will I will dig out some references and get them to them. Great thanks Matt. Well that's all the the list of um, questions I had in the chat box but if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask Matt directly please feel free to. Hi. Hi I'm Claire. Hi Claire. Hi. Um, I'm representing the North Craven Heritage Building Preservation Trust. Um, can I just ask Matt about insulating underfloor, recycled glass, if he's got any feelings on that? Yeah, so it's um, uh, it's a great system if you're digging up your floor and uh, uh, using that product. It's used extensively for kind of um, underfloor heating systems underneath that. Um, I think Jupiter is probably the... the, the um, uh, the main um, or well biggest well-known system um, does work very well. Um, it's great because it's reusing a, a, a waste dish material, um, performs incredibly well as well. So yeah, if, if you are digging up your floor and putting it in, um, it does work very well, but obviously it's some um, extensive disruption to it. So it's not something you e can easily retrofit, but if you're um, doing other works, then yeah, it's certainly worth looking at. Thank you very much. Anyone else got a question? Yes. Go for it. Sean Pinchbeck, can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Oh, you've gone on mute again. This, this relates to an old coal house. Uh, where coal used to be stored that is um, 60 years old and uh, in, in, a, in a dilapidated state, but we're seeking to renovate it and convert it into a community centre. I'm a big supporter of underfloor heating and we would want to have solar panels. The, the base is obviously going to be extremely solid because it, it withstood coal being poured onto it for 100 years. So would you, on the face of it, be thinking underfloor heating uh, somehow ideally heated by the solar panels on the south facing roof would be on the face of it the best way to to try and go yes yeah, certainly if that community building is being used extensively all day every day which um uh most but not all are uh then underfloor heating does sound quite sensible and obviously that goes very nicely to a heat pump it may be you need to build up the floor level if that's possible and i don't know the floor levels and the rest of it if you don't want to dig out a massive, great, big, hard, <laughs> solid slab, because um, you will need to get some insulation in underneath the underfloor to make sure that he goes up into the building or down into the ground. Um, ah, so yeah. so you you wouldn't be able to put the heat underfloor heating on top of the existing base? You would, but you'd need a layer of insulation in underneath the underfloor heating. So that's where you'd be building up the current floor level. So oh, I see. What floor level there, yeah. You need insulation in. Then you're underfloor yeah. heating system and whatever floor finishes you've got. Yeah, got you. Um, I understand. Yeah. In, in, in that. So 
yeah. that all works and would work well with a heat pump. Um, the solar panels are probably a slightly separate uh, thing. They're still good to do. I'm not knocking them. Um, yeah. but they don't really coordinate with heating because solar panels generate most of their electricity in the summer. You want your heating yeah. on in the winter. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in the winter, you'll probably be lucky if your solar panels uh, are generating enough electricity for your lighting uh, uh, and won't have capacity, you know, unless you've got a massive array, um, which will then end up being hugely oversized in the summer and, and would be uneconomical. The two don't really match particularly well. That's not to say that one isn't worth doing, but your, your solar panel electrical production isn't really a solution for your heating. Um, got it. Your heating would be under floor heating and heat pumps. Yeah, in fact, it may, it's making me wonder whether solar panels would actually even be sensible from what you've said, because you wouldn't need the heating in the summer, really, very much at all. If Yeah, you... so they, they, they probably are because solar panels could help with your lighting. Um, and yeah. even in some of most of those sorts of buildings have artificial lighting in them in some rooms. Um, you're probably going to have things like server rooms and computers running uh, or presentation material. You'll probably have fridges yeah. running in there, which are run 24-7. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, equally, if your hot water is electric, which it should be, that yeah. will be running in the summer. So for all of those yeah. reasons, solar panels are useful yeah. and should be yeah. done, but they're for all the other reasons other than your heating yes. um, uh, in there. Got it. Thank you. Brilliant. Oh, I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> so much to take in. Um, does anyone else have a question before we wrap up? Hello, it's Mike from uh, Astrogenza Community Trust here. I, Hi, I was Mike. involved in a group uh, a few years ago and we did some research and we actually were interested in that at that time in combined heat and power systems on a domestic scale or a smaller than district heating scale. Is there any is there anything being done on those at the moment? Are, are those uh, to be considered at all? Um, yeah, so combined heat and power um, really needs gas. Um, okay, uh, yes. Going into it. And because the focus... That changes now, the perspective, yes. Yeah, has now shifted to, to avoiding the use of any fossil fuels in any form whatsoever. That's, uh, a, good, that's a good enough answer for me. Yeah, CHP has kind of started to fall out of favour. There are right. certain circumstances where it still has some validity, um, but they tend to be big industrial processes. Um uh, but fine, um, that makes sense. Yeah, domestically, it's probably moved on a little bit since then. Okay, thanks very much. Brilliant. Right then, Matt will we'll release you to go and have some well earned cups of tea, I think. <laughs> There's a lot of talk in there, but thank you so much. That's been an absolute gold mine of inf information. Um, if anyone does think of any any questions, just feel free to email me with them and I will I'll pass them on to Matt. But you will have an email from me in the next couple of days and I'll put links and anything else that Matt sends to me um, and the slides in that email. So um, look out for that. But yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us. And Matt, thanks again. That's been brilliant. My pleasure. Thank you all. See you all soon.